Kia ora. Welcome to the second to last episode of Women Power. This week we'll speak to feminist mother Julie Timmins about unconscious bias and how it discriminates against women and non-Pākehā people. We'll also hear from designer Anna Stretton about her mentoring program for domestic violence survivors. But first, an update on the responses from political parties to the women's election agenda Aotearoa 2014, the 100 point plan for improving women's equality. We sent letters to the nine main political parties asking them to respond by telling us which of the 100 points they would support. United Future said that, as it was a small party, it did not have the resources to respond to each of the 100 points. The party forwarded a copy of its 2011 election manifesto. Policies for that election included renaming and refocusing the Ministry of Women's Affairs to call it the Ministry of Gender Affairs and recognise that the specific needs of both genders need to be addressed. The manifesto said that it should be recognised that both men and women were perpetrators of family violence and policies should be targeted accordingly. The party called for an end to gender discrimination recognising that both women and men could end unwelcome discrimination. United Future said parental leave should be extended to recognise the imperative for fathers to bond with their newborns. The manifesto said that fatherlessness was regarded as the major predicator of delinquency in youth. The Care of Children Act should also be amended to make explicit a presumption of shared care when parents separated. Now, let's talk to Julie Timmins about unconscious bias and its negative impacts on women. Kia ora Julie, welcome to the programme. Kia ora Katrina, it's great to be here. What is unconscious bias? Well, unconscious bias is, has come about, the knowledge about it has come about, I guess, in the last 20 years because in that time there's been more revealed or knowledge about the brain and the unconscious mind than in history. And I suppose a very short definition would be those automatic thoughts that arise without our conscious direction. And a much more kind of um, academic scientific description would be the subtle cognitive errors that lie beneath the rim of awareness. So when, you have, um, when you're born, you immediately start laying down transcript, basically, from your observations of everything around you and eventually you develop these mental shortcuts which of course stand us in good stead if we're in a dangerous situation or something like that but eventually over time they lead to blind spots as we uh, particularly when we come to perhaps stereotyping about groups so they have uh, unconscious bias has a very good function in that it can protect us but it also has a function which leads to prejudice and discrimination and I guess today on a, a program called Woman Power, that's perhaps more what we're talking about. It, it also leads you to question things such as that old expression that your parents might have said to you, trust your gut, trust your intuition. Well, unfortunately, our intuition is informed by those prejudices or the lens with which we view society. So what different types of unconscious bias are there? So I presume that in our culture there would be quite a lot of unconscious bias in relation to gender and perhaps race and perhaps um, sexual identity? Absolutely. Uh, race and gender would be the ones where there's been the most study and they would be the most well-known ones. Uh, sexual identity but also age mm. and weight and then just social, uh, so social class, simple things like where someone went to school, where they were born, I mean, it, it is a huge range, but most of the study would have been done in the area of race, gender, and age. And so how does it work in relation to gender? I guess we might think that if there's all white male managers and company directors, then if they're recruiting for a position, then they might feel that they're comfortable with another white male because that person's familiar mm. and also that perhaps their definition of merit 
would relate to qualities that they have and this white male might have, whereas a woman or a Māori or Samoan person might be seen as different. Absolutely, that is exactly what happens. I mean, I should have said that one of the things about unconscious bias is we all have it. We all have them. So generally when we're talking, people are, I, you know, there is conscious bias, but I don't think many people actually get up in the morning and think, right, today I'm going to discriminate. So that is what is so interesting about it, that it is much more of an unconscious process. And we all tend to uh, veer towards what we know. So I often think of that old saying about art, oh, you know, I, I don't know about art, but I know what I like, whereas in fact, we like what we know. Mm. And I think that is the sort of thing that can be applied. Uh, in New Zealand, in, in regard to the gender pay gap, um, the Ministry of Women's Affairs has recently released a report on leadership and they have signalled unconscious bias as being one of the main reasons for that pay gap. But I think it goes back further, it goes back to actually how females are regarded and so you get the uh, instance where, you know, the, the low regard for unpaid work, the work that women do, whether that be in the home or involuntary or the low pay for caring. So they start, start off on the back foot immediately. And um, then when they come to apply for jobs, uh, studies have shown that if somebody put something as simple as PTA, that that will be regarded by the people evaluating the CVs um, much, much less kindly. Uh, now you might think that might be something that goes across the genders, but it doesn't because men who write father and involvement with PTA get regarded very warmly. So women, in this particular study in the States, women who wrote down involvement with PTA for a start, they didn't get called back for interviews half as much as women and men who didn't put that down. And the men though who put down fathers, they were called back more and then Amazingly, the women were offered lower starting salaries and the men were offered higher starting salaries. So that's, um, that's one of the ways that, uh, that it does impact upon the gender pay. And that, that starts with recruitment and it just really carries on through. How can unconscious bias be recognised? I think that... Um, Probably the main way is simply by observing these differences that we've just been talking about. So where you, for instance, New Zealand is one of the most diverse countries in the world now. But clearly, if you look at our parliament, if you look at our media, um, and you look at positions of power, then they are still dominated by white males. So in gender it's that, and then if you come to race and you look and you'll see uh, where, where are all the different e ethnicities. I mean, if you turn on our television programs or you read the newspaper, you would think that we are simply a European white country. So I think for a start, you say to yourself, well, there's something going on here. And the reason that unconscious bias began to emerge as possibly something extra um, no, I'm not saying that very well, but diversity programs and positive discrimination programs have been going on across the world for a long time. But people in this area began to realise that they'd reached a plateau. There'd been a certain amount of increase and adva or bringing people up to an equal position and then it had stopped. And so why was this? And so this is where they began to really look at unconscious bias. And at the same time, two uh, professors at Harvard were developing the IAT test, the Implicit Association Test. And if people are really interested in this, go online and take these tests. And they just show our immediate, um, because you do respond immediately. And we all have these prejudices which really will su surprise people. And th these, these tests have now been subjected to thousands almost of research to see are they true or not because they're quite confronting when you do them. But there, there is no doubt now that A, um, unconscious bias or implicit bias as it sometimes calls exists and B, that these tests are very um, relevant to finding out where. Unfortunately, I don't know of any, that you can go online and do it as an Australian, you can't do it 
as a New Zealander, I believe at Auckland Med School they are looking at this with the students and trying to develop something that's more um, relevant to New Zealand. Yeah. How can unconscious bias be addressed? And can you tell us in the one minute we've got left? Oh, really? Is that all we've got left? <laughs> well, for a start, by recognising it. Now, there's no point in recognising and becoming aware of unconscious bias unless those who hold the power recognise their own place of privilege. So uh, how can it be addressed? Well, it can be addressed by policies. And uh, it, one great study is the orchestra study where they decided in this particular orchestra, 20% of the positions were held by women. So they decided to do blind auditions and didn't see the gender of the players and overnight 40% of the positions began. Now you can't obviously do that for all the jobs, but you can try and, and reduce am ambiguity with the recruitment process. But the main thing is to become aware of it, to bring in policies, to involve everyone in those policies. But outsmarting the machine in our head is not that easy. <laughs> we can only give it a go. Thanks very much, Charlie. Yeah, thank you, Katrina. Now it's time for the Woman Power Fail and Woman Power Win. Actor and longtime bachelor George Clooney last week announced his engagement. Hadley Freeman, writing in The Guardian, has compared the media coverage of the announcement with that surrounding actress Jennifer Aniston's engagement. Mr Clooney's fiance is a 36-year-old human rights barrister whose work is internationally renowned. But forget that, the media knows that secretly the real aim of her life has been to get married. Journalists reported that she had tamed, hooked and tied down Mr Clooney. Mr Clooney had previously been portrayed as sexy, independent and living every man's dream life. Rather than his series of short relationships being portrayed as an unsuccessful love life, he was said to be lucky to evade the clutches of scheming women. By contrast, Jennifer Aniston, despite being successful, famous and wealthy, was said to be desperate to get married, unlucky in love, pathetic and needy. Women for Peace and Justice organised a million woman protest march in the Nigerian capital Abuja, demanding that the government take firm action to rescue more than 200 girls abducted by militants. The schoolgirls aged between 12 and 17 were kidnapped by Boko Haram Islamists three weeks ago. Boko Haram's name translates as Western Education is Forbidden and the group has repeatedly attacked schools during an insurgency aimed at creating a strict Islamist state in mainly Muslim northern Nigeria. One report suggested that the girls had been taken to Chad and Cameroon and sold as brides to Islamist fighters for $12. The Nigerian government has faced scathing criticism over its lack of action to rescue the girls. Now, let's welcome designer Anna Stretton to talk to her about her mentoring program for domestic violence survivors. It's called RAW, or Reclaiming Another Woman. Kia ora Anna, welcome to the program. Hi Katrina, need to be here. What inspired you to create the Reclaiming Another Woman scheme? Oh, that's a big question, but I suppose late last year, um, October, November in 2013, I was fortunate enough to be in the space of the CEO of the Waikato Women's Refuge, Ronnie Albert, and she's done an awesome job supporting women that are in difficult and, um, difficult and violent situations. And part of our conversation was I convinced her to let me go up to the safe house that they have in Hamilton and meet some of the women that were there. And it was that that journey that kind of led me to think about um, how I could perhaps assist other than just aligning and working from a funding point of view. So meeting the woman was I suppose the turning point for me. I, um, most of the women were Maori. Um, they were very young between sort of 18 to 23, 24 and um, two to six children. You know, So they'd lived a hell of a lot of life um, before they ended up in the space that they were in. Mm -hmm. How does the scheme work? 
It's, um, it's really simple. Um, it's simply a matching of a significant other with a woman that's been through a domestic violence situation. Now, a lot of people um, seem to think that they have to be in refuge or you have to go through the refuge environment to be eligible for RAW. That's not the case. So it's simply taking a significant other like myself um, and then matching them with a woman that has been in a difficult situation. And we, we look at, when we're, making, when we're putting together those partnerships, it's really important for us to make sure that there's a, a good matching. So Women that will work um, well together and the goal with RAW is actually looking to advance through education so it's educating for choice which so it's taking women like myself that actually think like that um, and want to kind of take one woman and walk this journey of education and that can take three four five years I mean especially if you're looking at getting women um, degrees so yeah, it's, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a quick journey, especially if women that haven't had the chance to study at all. Well, most before. of the most of the women that we're working with at the moment, and we've got 57 matches, and we've only been going four weeks, so that's pretty that's incredible. Amazing. So, yeah. <coughs> 57 matches, and the, all of those women are in education at some level. So, most of them in literacy training because they have left school, or they've for all sorts of reasons they've chosen not to go beyond what is the old form two. I know it's probably called something else now, but <laughs> form two, and um, they've now gone on to. Um, start to think about the possibilities that could exist for them. But as I say, that does start with literacy in most cases. Mm. How do you find the mentors for the scheme? Well, I, I'm fortunate enough that for, uh, we're piloting in the Waikato at the moment, and for 21 years my brand has been relatively operational nationally, but uh, we do, and we do hub in the Waikato because that's where our head office is. So um, initially it's been talking to people like yourself or you know, working through the media to get voice out and, talk and dialogue happening around war, and that in turn attracts these very capable woman. I've got to be careful that I don't make them sound, you know, as if I'm um, looking for the Jenny Shipleys of the world <laughs> because, um, you know, there's, it's, it's really a woman that is actually living and walking a very different pathway to, the, to these women that we're, they're, they're required to support. So for me, I look for, um, I suppose, a whole lot of things, but it is about capability. Um, it is about a longevity of, of the model, um, and it is about knowing that you can actually be in the space and support someone that is just so different um, and is come from such a different environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of our most successful pairings is a police officer with a hardened criminal. Oh, really? Yeah, so Tell us a bit more juxtap about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the juxtaposition of that has been absolutely awesome. So, mm -hmm. But these two have become more than um, just the mentor and mentoree. They've, they've become two very, very strong friends that um, have, are furthering each other's agenda in so many ways. I mean, the police woman is now considering looking at a much bigger focus on domestic violence from within the police force. So she's actually looking to change her pathway as well. But the girl that's been you know, traditionally following a criminal pathway um, is now in her own home. I mean, her son runs up to the um, sort of, whenever he sees a police car, he runs up to the car thinking it, that it might be um, Jen. Um, obviously, it's not always, but I'd say in the past he would have been throwing rotten fruit at it if he could have. But, you know, just a very different mentality around that. So it's, it's exciting to see the pairings, the changes. And, you know, I have lots of stories like that, lots of stories. It's, it's been an awesome, awesome scheme. It really has. And what specifically do you hope comes out of the scheme for each woman or does it depend on you know each individual woman and her situation? No not really I mean the ultimate goal is educating because most I mean education education gives you choice I mean you and I know that I mean just recently I was fortunate enough to go to India with um, Vicky Trudell our British High Commissioner and now I spent um, a week there and saw the effect of the um, the Indian government the, who is endeavouring to get a school within a 2k radius of every child now there's a massive population there and poverty is absolutely absolutely rife. I mean, it's, it's a long way away from an environment like New Zealand. But we really have got a very strong um, underbelly in this country that is eroding um, a lot of what we are as, in, you know, as a society and endeavouring to move forward. It's also incredibly expensive on society to um, you know, have these people that are essentially going to be living off benefits for the rest of their lives. So my goal is to actually educate them so that they start not only to be free from a system that's always going to be capped as to what they can actually earn through that and they're always looking for that loophole that how can I get some extra, um, how can I get more money to pay my rent or stop my power being cut off or ensure that my car's le 
illegal to drive on the road, um, right through to that environment where not only are they driving their own outcomes around income, but they're also out there creating the multiplier effect around change. You know, you change one woman, you change the children that are coming behind, you change all of those women that are surrounding her as well. I mean, my the girl I'm working with, Crystal, um, her mum and her brother um, are looking at also coming into the program as well. So, you know, there's all sorts of change that happens when you just change one woman. So yeah. one significant woman walking alongside another woman, pretty simple really, <laughs> it really is. And, um, and no, I mean, a lot of people say to me, God, you know, do you have trouble finding mentors? No, we don't. Um, it's quite the opposite. We have trouble getting women to come forward and say, you know, I'm one of these victims. I actually need this support. Mm -hmm. And when they get paired up, is there a set amount of time that each person is committing for or it's just completely open-ended from the start? It, it, obviously the, the uh, when we speak or when we start to talk to mentors, it's really important that they know that there's going to be a relatively long-term relationship that needs to exist here. So, um, you know, they don't probably want to get involved if they kind of think, well, I'll give it a few weeks or I'll give it a couple of months. Or, you know, I, I have an expectation that they'd at least walk for a year. Um, I, would, I would say from the pairings that have happened, most women will walk for the rest of their lives. I know that Crystal, my mentoree, will be in my life for the rest of my life. I mean, so I think the relationship evolves and develops because they truly do see another side of life that they've just never been exposed to. I mean, I had no idea people were living like this in the, in the country. I mean, I thought that once were warriors was fiction. I mean, and so the reality for me now, um, and a lot of my reality, I suppose, is Crystal's reality. So I kind of know um, what it is that she has to deal with most days. And not, not, not in, as much as she does, but I certainly have started to touch on that. Hmm. And you said that it's, the scheme is being piloted in the Waikato, so does that mean that it could be rolled out to other places? No, will be. Yeah. will be, yeah. Um, at the end of May, we're looking to open um, the, the scheme up in Christchurch, so we're already setting up for our opening and our connections and the types of people that we need to start talking to. We'll take those relationships that we've formed in the Waikato and we'll replicate them in, in Christchurch. We're also um, wanting to make sure that we're actually, I mean, we're very much Maori focused at the moment, um, and that's come about through our connection with Te um, the, the Waikato Refuge, which is by its very namesake, I, su uh, namesake, I suppose, more attracted to Māori. Um, but from, from my point of view, it is good that we have a very broad demographic um, in war and we're not just about Māori, um, we're very much about Māori and Europeans. So Christchurch um, appears to have a need. It, it, it appears to be you know, um, a good space to actually go and replicate the model um, as we start to roll it out. So Christchurch next and then possibly South Auckland, which is a little closer to home. Mm, fantastic. And if people want to help the scheme, how can they help? Do you need more mentors? Do you need money? What do you need? <laughs> we always need money, but <laughs> <laughs> um, at the moment my own foundation is, um, is funding raw, so really that's relatively secondary. Um, the mentor mentory partnering um, is, 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 is not that expensive. You know, that's, that's relatively cost effective. Um, from my point of view, it is about if you want to get involved, it is going to raw.org.nz and just log on I mean, and there's a pathway there that'll show you how to get involved. And if you don't think that mentoring's kind of your thing, there's also the volunteer base or the Friends of Raw, but you know, I would suggest that if you're in a positive framework, a positive environment, um, you believe that education is the way forward and you'd like to get involved, um, it's certainly something that I think you'd find incredibly worthy. Thanks very much, Anna. Thank you. Now it's time for News of the Week. A campaign has been launched calling on people to say no to sex tourism at the Soccer World Cup in Brazil in June and July. Brazil is one of the countries in South America and the Caribbean with the highest incidences of sex tourism. The country is a large source, destination and transit country for children, women and men subjected to sex trafficking. Reports of sexually trafficked children are particularly high in northeastern Brazil, where the World Cup will be held. Child sex tourists typically arrive from Europe and the United States, but local demand for prostitution is also high. Amnesty International has accused authorities in Qatar of failing to protect domestic workers, citing cases of abuse, sexual violence and forced labour. In a report called My Sleep Is My Break, Amnesty records shocking testimonies of violent abuse. Women reported being slapped, pulled by the hair, poked in the eyes and pushed downstairs by their employers. Three said that they were raped. 
Women are seen as pushovers when they don't negotiate in pay talks and too aggressive when they do, says psychologist Gly Bahava Monteith. She's one of the panellists for the YWCA's Equal Pay Awards, which aim to recognise companies striving to tackle the gender pay gap. Women in Aotearoa earn 13% less than men. Ms Bahava Monteith says women in leadership positions face unconscious bias. If they're overly feminine, they're seen as weak, while if they are authoritative and energetic, they're regarded as bitches. I attended an extremely valuable seminar in April about child custody evaluations where there are allegations of child abuse and intimate partner violence. American doctor Robert Geffner of the Family Violence and Sexual Assault Institute presented a detailed evaluation of how domestic violence is ignored and minimised by the family court in the United States, just as happens in the family court in New Zealand. His presentation contains many research references and other valuable information and can be found on the New Zealand Family Violence Clearinghouse's website under the Seminar tab. The Ministry of Women's Affairs has released a compilation of 117 items about ways to improve women's career paths within organisations. You can find it on the Ministry's website under the Documents tab. You can also find a paper called Etu Aki, which provides information about improving economic independence for women with low or few qualifications or who are not in education, training or work. Now, here are the five action points from this week's episode. Meet with your MP to tell him or her what gender equality policies you want advanced in 2014. Write to the nine main political party leaders to tell them that you will only vote for parties which advance gender equality. Be aware of how unconscious bias discriminates against women and non-Pākehā people. Explain to people that unconscious bias has a negative impact even when those who exhibit it don't consciously intend to discriminate. Encourage companies and workplaces to have training about unconscious bias. That's our programme for this week. Join us next week for the last episode of Woman Power. We'll talk to Dr Huhana Hickey about what policies women with disabilities would like political parties to put forward this year. We'll also hear from Dr Rachel Simon Kumar about the role of ethnic women in New Zealand elections. Thanks for watching. Kaki Teano.